Hey everyone, I'm Richard and today we'll be looking in depth at Intel's Core i5-6500. So until recently, this processor wouldn't have attracted too much attention from gamers. After all, the K-series overclockable chips are where you want to go if you want a faster, more future-proof system. But a couple of things made me want to check this out. First of all, there's the fact that recent BIOS upgrades to motherboards from MSI, uh, ASUS, ASRock, BioStar and others are allowing you to overclock any Intel Skylake chip, including this one. Now, secondly, if you watched our recent Core i3-6100 dual-core review, you'll see that pairing a locked processor with faster memory can produce significant frame rate boosts in CPU-bound scenarios. Now, what I was thinking was pretty straightforward. If that's the case with a dual-core chip like the i3, what about the i5? First up, let's check out our test system here. We're using the i5-6500 mounted into an MSI Z170A Gaming M5 motherboard, and we've paired it with two 4GB sticks of Corsair Vengeance DDR4 rated for 3000 MHz. Now, we were able to overclock this up to 3200 MHz in our tests with no problems at all. And we also cooled the processor itself with a Corsair H110i GTX, but we limited all of our overclocking tests for the CPU to 1.3 volts. And that should ensure that any decent third-party cooler should do the job. And finally, for our benchmarking tests, we used Nvidia's monstrous Titan X overclocked. Running at a mere 1080p resolution, the aim is to have as close as we can get to a bottomless pit of GPU power and in theory, that should put CPU and system RAM to the forefront. First up, let's stress that you really should pair any gaming Skylake setup with a Z170 board like the gaming M5 that we've got here. The motherboard, well, it's the core of your system and it's the basis of future expandability. It's really tempting to go cheap, but really, don't do it. If you want to run memory faster than 2133 MHz, and trust me, you really should, you'll need a Z170 board. And also, if you want to upgrade to an officially overclockable K CPU, you'll need a Z170 board again to get the most out of it. And finally, if you want to overclock a locked Intel chip, like this one, once again, you'll need a Z170 board. At this point, well, I think you get the point. So, first up, let's take a look at how the i5-6500 operates at stock speeds. Most modern games these days support up to eight threads, so an i7 will take point, but the i5 still offers the best sweet spot in terms of price versus performance. Now, this i5-6500 runs at a fairly conservative 3.2 GHz, compared to the 3.5 GHz base clock found on the 6600K. So, there is a small deficit in stock performance, but assuming you've paired the chip with something like a GTX 970, and a locked 60 FPS is your target, generally there's really not much in it. Now, as you can see here with Shadow of Mordor and Assassin's Creed Unity, even with an overclocked Titan X at 1080p, the GPU is still the major limiting factor. The i5-6500 costs around half as much as a 6700K, but there's no appreciable difference in performance. But in games that are really challenging for the CPU, we see something different. Crisis 3 uses all eight threads, and while average frame rate is still competitive with a 6500, the lowest frame rate takes a hit, and arguably that's the most important metric in gameplay. It's where you feel the hit to performance most. You'll note that the i5-6600K at stock speed only has a small boost over the much cheaper chip that we're reviewing here. Now, the i7, it's an absolute monster with The Witcher 3, with the lowest recorded frame rate a whole 24 FPS faster than the i5-6500 and 17 FPS faster than the 6600K. For the most part, all of our Intel quads here do stay above 60 FPS, but we've observed that games that support eight threads generally enjoy higher scores from the lowest recorded frame rates. And generally, that translates to less in-game stutter. It's the kind of observation traditional bar chart benchmarks can't really show, but we can here with our contextual analysis. Finally, 
The maxed out GTA 5 is another CPU nightmare. Even the stock i7 can dip below 60 FPS here when the game's totally maxed out, requiring an overclock. But as expected, what causes problems for the i7 is even more impactful on the i5. And again, note that the stock i5 6500 perf isn't lagging that much behind the stock 6600K. So, with those benches, we're running with 2666 megahertz RAM. It doesn't cost much more than the cheapo 2133 megahertz stuff, but in our experience, it helps to mitigate memory bandwidth as a potential bottleneck in gaming. Now, going into this review, the question I had was pretty straightforward. How much slower is basic RAM? And at the other end of the spectrum, what happens if we pair a stock i5 like this one without overclocking it with faster memory? Well, I rebenched the processor with RAM at four different speeds, 2133, 2666, 3066, and 3200 MHz. Now, curiously, this Corsair RAM is actually rated for 3000 MHz, but using its standard XMP profile, it actually seemed to overclock the CPU slightly, so we bumped it up to 3066, which kept the CPU at a perfectly stock speed. There are some games in our test suite where faster RAM doesn't really seem to make any difference with the i5 here, and it's perhaps no coincidence that it's mostly the titles where we suspect that the GPU remains the primary bottleneck, even when we're using an overclocked Titan X running at 1080p. So, case in point, Battlefield 4. Not much going on here, though there is a small bump. Lowest recorded frame rates, well, yeah, the slowest is about 5 FPS slower than the fastest. And you see the same story here with Assassin's Creed Unity. There is a difference, but we stick well north of 60 FPS in all cases. No problem at all. Crisis 3, well, even though we're CPU bound for much of this sequence, there's still not really much to comment on. But the difference can be fascinating. Lowest recorded frame rate in our Witcher 3 test sequence rises by 9 FPS, when 3066 MHz RAM is used instead of 2133. That's a 22% increase in in-the-moment performance just from using faster RAM. Average performance across the clip rises by 18%. Now remember, all we're doing here is using faster RAM. We have not overclocked the i5 itself at all. Another interesting thing to note here is that the Witcher 3 actually loses a little performance when we push the RAM up to 3200 MHz. It doesn't lose much, and I suspect it's margin of error stuff, but it does show that beyond 3000 MHz, the law of diminishing returns starts to kick in. Far Cry 4, that's another interesting example. 16% increase in lowest recorded frame rates and a 16% boost to the average. Again, no CPU overclocking here, just faster RAM. And there's a 14% increase to lowest frame rate and the overall average in GTA 5. Now, we're using an overclocked Titan X here to make CPU the primary bottleneck in our tests as best as we can. In most gaming scenarios, it's more likely that you'd pair an i5 with something a little more realistic. Let's say Nvidia's GTX 970. There, for the most part, frame rates will indeed be limited by the graphics card, not the CPU. But when you are limited by the CPU, it doesn't matter what GPU you have, you're held back by the processor. And in that scenario, faster memory can help. Now, I like to think of it as a hierarchy of potential bottlenecks in your PC. GPU first, then CPU and memory. GPU is the most important, but ideally, you'd want to make sure that all three are fast enough. So here's a perhaps more realistic scenario, The Witcher 3 with our i5 paired with an overclocked GTX 970. All we're doing here is taking a leisurely gallop through Novigrad City. It's basically a rerun of our Titan X benchmark, just with a slower GPU. You'll see that performance is equalized somewhat, as the 970 is more of a limiting factor here. However, you can still see in-the-moment differences where faster RAM provides higher frame rates. And if you look at the frame times, you'll see much more stutter with the base 2133 MHz RAM. Differences between 2666 and 3066 aren't quite so pronounced now though, presumably because we have enough horsepower in both scenarios to hit GPU limits. But really, that's what makes profiling CPU performance so difficult. Benchmarking a graphics card, it's the primary limiting factor. You whack up all the settings to max and you see how fast it is, perhaps comparing it to other GPUs running the same task. But in actual gameplay, you never quite know what the bottleneck really will be. Tools like Reva Tuna Statistics Server 
have an OSD that can show you CPU load as you play, and that can help. But in a game like Fallout 4, it doesn't really register as maxed out utilization on the CPU cores at all. Only by overclocking CPU and RAM can you actually see that those elements are indeed the limiting factor. But that's another cool thing about the i5-6500. With the recent base clock overclocking BIOSes released for many Z170 boards, now you can overclock this previously locked chip and get extra performance. It's entirely unofficial, it's not without its problems, and I'll just say for the record that it's not as flexible as overclocking with a K chip. But regardless, it's there and it's a lot of fun. So CPU speed is defined by two factors, base clock, which is 100 megahertz on Intel chips and the multiplier. So this particular i5 has a locked multiplier of 32, 32 times 100, 3200, 3.2 gigahertz. A K chip lets you increase the multiplier, add extra voltage, and you should easily be able to get 4.4 or 4.5 gigahertz. It's literally a case of changing just two numbers in the BIOS. Though finding the best value, the highest multiplier and the lowest voltage to sustain it, well, that's the trick. That's what takes time. Overclocking a locked chip like the i5-6500 is different. You can't change the multiplier. So in this case, it stays at 32. So you need to tweak the base clock instead. We pushed our chip from 100 to 141 megahertz, and we required about 1.3 volts to make it stable. Now you'll note that increasing the base clock increases memory speed too, something that doesn't happen with a basic multiplier OC. So we need to dip into the memory settings and get it back to something approaching your memory's rated speed. Or if you fancy it, you can overclock the memory too, of course. So with our 141 megahertz base clock and with the locked 32 multiplier, basic maths 4.51 gigahertz. We bench this chip using 2632 and 3196 megahertz RAM. The results, well, the results can be phenomenal. Now, as before, some games are still limited by the GPU. The usual suspects like Battlefield 4, Shadow of Mordor and Assassin's Creed Unity. There are some increases, but they're minimal. However, Elsewhere, we see some remarkable results, and faster memory is an important component. Let's start by looking at The Witcher 3. With our CPU at 4.51 GHz, but running with 2632 MHz RAM, we're actually slightly slower than running the game with the CPU at stock speeds, but using faster RAM. But pairing the CPU overclock with faster memory, we see an explosive boost to performance, a 22% increase in lowest recorded frame rates, and a 15% boost to the overall average. GTA 5 gains a decent level of performance too with the 4.5 GHz overclock alone, an extra 10 FPS on both low and average frame rates. But it's interesting to note that while faster RAM helps the overclock here, the increase is fairly marginal. What this says to us is that some games prefer memory bandwidth to CPU speed, while others respond better just to the processor overclock. Far Cry 4 benefits from both processor and memory overclocks. Now there's a massive 43% increase in lowest recorded frame rate as we move from the i5 at stock speeds with fast RAM to the overclock with slightly slower RAM. But overclocking memory too adds a further 12% to the lowest recorded frame rate and about 8% to the average. Interesting stuff. On the flip side, Crisis 3 is an example of how faster RAM doesn't always make a huge amount of difference. It's all about the CPU frequency. But generally speaking, based on what we're seeing on The Witcher, there's a strong argument that any CPU overclock should be matched by scaling up memory speed too. So, this is what's exciting about overclocking these supposedly locked chips. We actually have two avenues for increasing performance now. We can overclock the chip itself, we can overclock the memory, and both can provide tangible gains, especially working together. Our advice would be to buy the fastest RAM you can afford, and don't be afraid to overclock that too. But we should stress that as fun as overclocking this locked i5 has been, it is a budget option compared to a K-series chip, and there are limitations to match. So, for example, power efficiency, that goes out of the window here. The C states, which lower CPU frequency when your PC is idling, well, they don't work anymore. Intel's Turbo Boost technology, that's disabled. Not that you really need it when you're overclocking, but more relevant, CPU temperature measurement tools don't seem to work anymore, which isn't fun when you're trying to make sure your chip isn't overheating. So my advice there, go easy on voltage. Also, there's every chance that Intel may try to lock this out with microcode updates that motherboard vendors need to add to future BIOS updates. So going forward again, 
think twice about upgrades there. But regardless, this is really exciting stuff overall. We're taking a locked Intel chip where it really shouldn't be taken. And while a K chip is a better bet overall, price and availability issues are making gamers look to the LOX processor and it's good to see that we can extract more performance from them. As things stand right now, I'd rate the Core i5 6500, whether you overclock it or not, as the best value quad-core chip on the market. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do give us a like if you did and subscribe to Digital Foundry for more. I'll see you soon, but for now, thanks for watching.